chapter 18. The songs that Brother Hill chose today are not necessarily the kind of songs that will make you want to stamp your feet or maybe run around the auditorium. But we need to learn to appreciate all kind of music as long as it honors God and it's biblical. I got news for you. When you get to heaven, there's not going to be one brand of music. And we're not going to be singing all the time either. And it's not going to be just one church service. Check your Bible. We'll be doing a lot of different things in heaven to glorify and honor God. I believe there will be a lot of different in musical instruments in heaven. It'll be a great thing, a great time. But learn to appreciate music that honors the Lord and it's biblical. Now on the way home today, I might put the Blackwood Brothers in and listen as I go home. But uh, that's me. And uh, if it honors the Lord, it's biblical. Six o'clock tonight, our prayer meeting uh, for our men and for our ladies and 6.30 our evening service. We're in chapter 9 of the book of Revelation. When hell comes to earth, tonight we look at an army of 200 million men, the angels that come from the Euphrates River, and uh, some amazing things. We'll have a missionary testimony tonight also. Next Sunday evening we'll be observing the Lord's Supper, so please remember that and keep that in your mind and in your thinking if you will. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, we've been looking at David, a man after God's own heart. We looked at how God chooses, and we looked at how God changes, and today we'll see how God cares for those who belong to him and his working in the life of David. Begin reading with me in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him. And behaved himself wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with the instruments of music. Hmm. Sounds sort of wild to me, but it was God's people, but they were doing it. Verse 7, And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more than the kingdom? You might want to underscore those words. And Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. And he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him, and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all of his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved, behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, but he went out and came in before him. Do you and I play fair? Now, I want you to think about that for just a second. Do you and I play fair? Now, before you cut me off, let me make this statement and give me a little time to develop what I'm going to say. David did not play fair. But Saul played fair. Now, let that sink in for just a moment. Playing fair means that if you withdraw from me, I'm going to withdraw from you. Playing fair means, if you won't forgive me, I won't forgive you. 
Playing fair means if you won't forget, I won't forget. Playing fair means if you want to get even, I'll get even. Playing fair means that if you're sarcastic with me, if somebody snaps and gets angry with me, I'm going to snap and get angry with him. That's playing fair. Here's the story of how God cared for David in a very difficult, difficult time. I want you to notice as this chapter moves along that Saul begins to be envious of David. You know why? Because he thinks that David is going to take something from him that he has. But God isn't trying, or David isn't trying to take a thing from Saul. God's already took it from him. I don't know about you, but I trust the Lord never sends an evil spirit into my life. And I become bitter and mean and hard to get along with. I pray that I don't get to the point that if somebody hurts me, I want to hurt them. I pray that I'll never get to the point that I'm so insecure in who I am and so insecure in my relationship with the Lord that I'm afraid you're going to take it from me. You can't take it from me unless God takes it from me if I'm secure in him. But here is a man who is head and shoulders over all the other people. He was the people's king, but because of his disobedience and partial disobedience, the Lord took the kingdom from him and gave it to David. God gave it to David. And so Saul becomes envious of David. Not only that, he becomes suspicious. What an awful thing. What an awful way to live, to be suspicious. Well, I wonder what he said about me. You know, look, look, look over there. They're talking. They must be talking about me. I wonder how things are going with that individual. Is he plotting against me? And so to become envious and to become suspicious. But it gets worse than that. All of this now begins to lead to Saul's anger. And not only does he become angry, but now this anger boils to the point that he is at the time where he's willing to kill. I'll do whatever I have to to hold on to what I have. They said David's slaughtered his tens of thousands. And to me, they've only ascribed thousands. Me. Me, me, me. I. That gets us in a lot of trouble. There's a lot of men who are Christians who've had the kingdom taken away from them because of I and me. And I want what you have and I'll do whatever I can to get it and take it away any way that I can. Notice now that Saul has a spear in his hand. A spear in that day was a sign of authority and a sign of power. Saul, in taking the spear in his hand, was saying to everyone, to those who ascribed David as tens of thousands, and to him only a thousand, he was saying, I want you to look at me, I'm the one with power. I want you to look at me, I'm the one with authority. But if you'll look at the life of David, and if you'll look at this portion of the life of David, what does David have in his hand? A shepherd's staff, a harp, and a sling. David is ready to do whatever job God has for him to do. He is not going to run ahead of God. He's not going to be envious of Saul. He is going to wait on God's timing. In all of these years of preaching, I've observed some things, and I've watched young preachers who want what an older preacher has. 
And they have the idea that they're more polished and they're better and they deserve it and so they want it and I want it now when in actuality God knows they're not ready. And David knew that he was not ready. But the time would come when he would be placed on the throne. Now let's get back to this matter of playing fair. Look at verse 8. And Saul was very wroth. The word wroth there means to burn. He was looking at the situation. He was looking at David. He was listening at what was being said. And when he saw it and observed it and he knew that he had lost it, it was going to go from him, he began to burn. What an awful, terrible way to live. To go through life and burn. And you know, the Bible says that people who are bitter, who become bitter, it affects a lot of people. You can't become wroth and bitter without affecting a lot of other people. You might not say anything. You might not uh, uh, do much, but just the bitterness that's oozing out will affect you. And so here is Saul burning. An evil spirit from the Lord has come upon him, and he's burning but it says also in the passage that he was displeased. The word displeased there in the passage has the idea that he has burned now to the point that he is willing to bring evil upon David. Now think with me for just a moment. A man in the family of God who is willing to bring evil on someone else. So what, Day, what Saul is doing, he says he's playing fair. David, I feel like you're trying to take something from me. I'm going to take from you. But I want you to watch. David didn't play fair. Look back in verse 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. The word behave there means that he was very circumspect in everything that he did. And the word wisely simply means that he answered each situation, he looked upon every situation, handled each situation with skill. Every single morning I pray, Lord help me to live out in my life, James chapter 1 and verse 5. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I know that I'm very limited in a lot of ways. I know my weaknesses. I know the warts. And I need wisdom. And I know that I'll not always do what's right, so I want wisdom from God. Now I want you to notice that God used these difficult circumstances in David's life to make him a great man of faith. Had it not been for these situations that arose, and God with tremendous love and care allowed these situations to come into David's life to prepare him for the future to become a man after God's own heart. Now here's something that's sad. Most believers, and I say that from observing for a long, long time, most believers will never take that next step that's needed. They will never move from mediocrity to greatness. They will never move from just being satisfied to being a man or a woman after God's own heart and they will live and they will die in mediocrity while a few will raise to the heights and they will hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Who is the most together person that you know? Who is the most balanced? 
Who is the most spiritual? Who is the one that you will go to when you need guidance? Who is the one that you will go to when you've been hurt and you need someone to just be there for you? I guarantee you it will be someone like David with whom God has cared for, lovingly cared for. He's been to the depths. He's been hurt. He's been trodden down. He's been there. He's been to the university of hard knocks. And you'll go to him because God has lovingly cared for him and brought him to this place. You see... The Christian life should never be one of failure. It should be one of the opposite. And God, in His wisdom and grace, brought David to a place where he was a complete person, where he was balanced, not perfect. Now let me pause right here for just a second. Before we judge too quickly... And before we fail to forgive, and before we begin to form lasting opinions, and we're not willing to change, let me remind you that there is not a man in the Bible that was not a sinner except Jesus. Was David a man after God's own heart? He was. But did he number the people and 70,000 people get killed because of it? Did he sin with Bathsheba? Yes. But God still loved him, and cared for him. Why did I say that? I said that because every person I'm looking at this morning, including this person that stands in the pulpit, has failed. We have all failed. You and I are going to fail again. But God still cares for us and still loves us and wants to bring us to a place of usefulness. Notice number one this morning, the presentation of David's life. You find it in verse 5 and verse 14 and verse 30. And you see in this passage of Scripture that David walked carefully, he walked accurately. I don't always do that. I wish I did. But I want to. Before I left my bed this morning, I asked the Lord to help me to walk circumspectly today and to walk accurately today. In verse 5, you will notice that David behaved himself wisely in spite of life's promotions. Verse 5, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all of the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Some men are not ready for promotions. I have watched it in my own life as I've observed people. I've watched young men get promoted when they were not ready. And the promotion ruined them. The power ruined them. But David is ready for promotion and God knows that he's ready for promotion. And the promotion does not ruin him because the Bible says he went out and came in among the people of God And they loved him. Had he set himself up as someone great and someone wonderful and someone more powerful as Saul had set himself up as with the javelin, the people would not have accepted him. But he he behaved himself wisely even when God promoted him. And I look at our young people that are sitting here today. God wants to promote you. Some of you are getting ready to graduate from high school. And you're thinking about the mission field. You're thinking about the ministry. You're thinking about the work of God. Don't rush the cycle. Wait till God promotes you. Wait till you're ready for that promotion. Behave yourself wisely. Uh, Walk accurately. And so he behaved himself wisely even in life's promotions in verse 5. You see, he climbed to the top, or God brought him to the top, One step at a time. God knew that he needed the secluded mountaintops, the deserts. God knew that he needed to fight a bear and a lion before he fought Goliath. God knew that he needed to react to Saul before he reacted to Goliath and to others. 
There are two times in the life of David that Saul was right before him, helpless. Now listen. Saul tried to kill David. You know what he said? He said, I'll drive him to the wall with this spear. What did David do when Saul was at his pleasure? And he, even his men said, Look, David, the Lord has brought your enemy and placed him before you. You'll never have to run. You're free. And David said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. I'll not go ahead of God. It's not my time. I will let God deal with with Saul. And David did not take it into his own hands. David didn't play fair. Saul, you don't like me because God's promoted me. And you've tried to kill me, but I'm not going to kill you. I could, but I will not. His own men was pushing him to do so, but he would not. I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Now, David didn't play fair. David didn't re react in anger and unkindness. God, or David, let God handle Saul. Would you have wanted to have been Saul in those last days? Miserable, hateful, always looking over his shoulder. And even when David let him go, Saul made the statement, Oh, David, my son. And even in saying that, there is evil in his heart. He lied about it. He said no. And then went after David even after that. In verse 14, he behaved himself in spite of life's problems. Here again you see that it is a man who did not seek revenge. There are people who go through life seeking revenge. The man who wants to play fair will do that. But the man like David will not seek revenge. He will let God handle the situation. And one day he will ascend to the throne. And the Lord will be with him even in the kingdom. And then verse 30 he behaved himself wisely in spite of life's possibilities. Now watch. According to the passage of Scripture we've just read, David was more popular than Saul. And because he was more popular than Saul, he could have had the kingdom even without killing Saul. And I want you to notice that he was more popular with the people, but he was also popular with Saul's servants. Isn't that amazing? A man who is walking circumspectly and wisely, a man who's being groomed to be a man after God's own heart, even in the face of all the possibilities, he still behaved himself very wisely. He could have had the kingdom, but he would not do so. In verses 10 through verse 13, you see the priorities of David's life. First of all, in verse 10, he was surrendered. He carried out every assignment that God gave him. David did not ascend to the throne and did not become a man after God's own heart through laziness. When God gave him a job to do, he did it. And did it faithfully and completed it. You know, sometimes the reason you and I are not promoted in the work of God is because we don't finish the jobs God gives us to do. And when we start out serving God, He understands that we're not ready for some positions. And we're not ready for some work. And so He'll give us what we are ready for, what we can handle. And when we learn from that, He takes us to the next step, and takes us to the next step, and takes us to the next step. I preached to our young people in school just a, a few weeks ago. And you know what I said to them? I say to them what I believe is true with all of my heart. If you walk down the hall in our school and you can't speak to an adult, 
and you can't treat an adult with respect, how do you think God's going to promote you? Because you're an athlete, because you're a cheerleader, you think you're better than anybody else? And that's the way you carry yourself? God's not going to promote you. Oh, you might achieve what this world can offer you, but you'll never achieve what God can offer you. So here's David. A man after God's own heart, surrendered to the Lord, carrying out his assignments. In verse 11, he's steadfast. I want to ask you a question. If there was someone in your life that was out to get you, you're doing what's right, but he's out to get you. And he's not playing fair. Would life be wonderful and exciting? It could be very difficult, couldn't it? But here's a man who knows that Saul's out to get him, but he's steadfast anyway. In verse 13, he's submissive to the things of God. And then in verses 17 through verse 23, there's a perception of David's life, and I've already mentioned that. There is a private perception. There is Saul's jealousy. Very blatant outwardly, but yet sneaky. And behind the scenes, and wouldn't play fair. There was a public uh, perception. Saul's men were impressed with him. And then there is his personal perception. He didn't think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And then verses 12 and verses 14, there's the power of David's life. Now here's the key to the whole thing. First of all, he had power with God. You know what that did? That gave him personal security. Now look, even though Saul's servants understood David and loved him, and even though the people knew David and loved him, that's not where he gained his security. Because David knew that people are fickle. And David knew that the person that pats you on the back one day might be your worst enemy the next day. And David understood that people forget quickly. I remember Brother Carey saying one day in a meeting, you know, a preacher can be at a church 30 years, 40 years, but he resigns and goes somewhere else. Those people that he pastored for all of those years pretty soon will just forget. They don't mean to. They don't mean to. They just do. It's human nature. Out of sight, out of mind. We're humans. David understood that, but his power was with God. His security was with God, not with others. And then his resources was in the Lord. He said in Psalms 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Look at verse 8 of our text. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. He began to burn. He was willing to bring evil on David. In verse 5, we see David walking circumspectly, walking with skill, and he would not fight unfairly the way Saul did. Now, turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 6. I want to go back to the thought that I began with at the outset of this message. Do we play fair? I want you to look at chapter 6 of the book of Luke. And I want you to look at this passage with me and I want you to notice that a child of God should go beyond playing fair. David did. Look at verse 32. For if you love them which love you, what think have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners and receive as much again. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. 
and your rewards shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. Now watch. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Aren't you glad God doesn't play fair with us? Aren't you glad God goes beyond playing fair? How do you do that? Well, number one, you give better than you get. You talk about me, I'm going to talk about you. I hear you won't forgive me, well, I won't forgive you. You spread rumors on me, I'll spread rumors on you. You know, that's not the Bible way. There's one thing I've learned. You'll live miserably if you say you've forgiven somebody, but you keep it in your heart and won't forget it. That's a miserable way to live. No, give back better than you get. Get rid of the anger that's in your life. Some people carry anger with them day after day after day after day. Again, ask God what's helpful. Lord, this person has said this, done this, whatever it may be. Lord, what is helpful? How can I help this situation to be better? What can I do? How can I help him? How can I help us? How can I help this situation? Ask God what's helpful. Then get past your own need. A lot of times the reason we act wrongfully toward others is because we've not dealt with the need in our own heart. There's something in here. Jeremiah said, Lord, correct me. We're willing to pray, Lord, correct me, then the Lord will help me to do that. And will help you to do that. Put their need ahead of your need. Isn't that what Jesus said here? Isn't that what the Bible says here? You know why you want to do that? Because love takes you to another level. Love takes you to another level. I have some preacher boys here and I have some people that are in the ministry and I think most of them will testify to the same thing. It doesn't matter what you do as a leader, somebody's not going to like you. Somebody's not going to like you. Well, what do you do? Respond to their anger? Respond to their unkindness? Absolutely not. You can't let that dictate your life. You've got a group of people to love and to care for. See how you can get past it and move on and serve God. And then lastly, give the opposite of what you get. They treat you wrongfully, treat them with love. Treat them with kindness. I made, uh, I think I made three trips to Duke this week. And you know, when you go out, you, you hand your, uh, as, as a pastor, we've got these cards, Brother Barham has them and I have them. And they're, they've got the uh, pictures on them. I have never taken a picture that's any good. I look terrible in every picture I've ever taken. And I always want to go, go down the hospital with that thing on, hide the picture, you know. Thinking I look better than a picture. But anyway... You hand your, you, you hand your uh, ticket, your, your parking ticket, to the guy with your name written on the back of it, and you hand him your pastor's card, and he'll click it off, and you, you, you go on out. Well, the first time I went over there this week, the guy must have had prunes and vinegar for breakfast, and, and I mean, he had a sour look on his face, and, and he was just as mean as he could be. You're a preacher, are you? Okay, here. Like... I shouldn't have given him the card, you know. And I'm, th and I'm thinking, there must be something wrong. You know, maybe he's divorced or something. And I just went on my way. Guess who the next two times I went out of the parking lot I, I got to go to? Same guy. So the second time I was just as friendly as I could be. And the last time I went out, he, I've got a, a, a Tennessee sticker on my car, and he said, Tennessee, huh? 
And I said, yes, sir. And, and he said, well, the next time you come through here, I'm going to take that thing off. And just laughed. Now, if I'd have been mean and unkind to him, he'd have still been mean and unkind to me. Now I think I've got a friend. Every time I go over there, he's going to see that sticker and we're going to fuss with one another and have a good time, hopefully. Now, some of you this week, driving down Capitol Boulevard, trying to get into sheets to get a good deal on gas, somebody cut you off, didn't they? It happens, doesn't it? You know what we want to do? Yeah! Lord, help us to be better than that. Amen? God cared enough for David to allow him to go through all of these situations with Saul so that he would eventually become a man after God's own heart. Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed?